<laughs> In retrospect, Officer Larry regretted asking how the accident happened. In retrospect, Officer Larry regretted asking how the accident happened. All right, so the uniform circular motion means something is moving in a circle at a constant speed. So the motion is occurring at a constant speed in a circle. That's what it means. The moment of truth. Each pilot has to practice his strain in the centrifuge. As he picks up speed, the gondola on the end of the arm swings out, turning the pilot on his side. This directs the G-forces from head to toe, simulating a high G-turn in an aircraft. The centrifuge rotates once every two seconds. For a young pilot, <coughs> it's quite an ordeal. The instructors know how tough it can be. They filmed themselves in the centrifuge on one occasion, recording the full G-lock horror. Those videos are awesome. I've seen a few of those. Pilots call these recovery spasms doing the funky chicken. Okay. How is that right? Yeah, you'll, you'll be seeing more of these later. Okay. So this guy is exposed to 7 Gs, right? Or close to 7 Gs. So they kept them there until it passed out. So the question is, how did they induce acceleration at constant, at a constant speed? Okay, so this was a test question previously. Most of you guys said, oh, because the person is changing direction. And changing direction is acceleration. Because when the direction changes, it changes the velocity. So that's an acceleration. Okay, so... For those of you guys who said because the direction changes, you end up getting one out of two points. And some of you guys also said, well, changing direction changes velocity and changing velocity is acceleration. That was a little bit more of a justification. Now you got one and a half out of two points. All right. I think with the exception of one or two people, no one gets full credit for it because you didn't really fully justify it. So where do we get these definitions from, guys? We get these definitions from real life. Too. So the mathematical representation of real life is these definitions or the formulas that you're looking at. How do we know that the change in direction is acceleration? That's what I was asking. In essence. So how do we know that something is accelerating? The car is accelerating what happens on the inside. Unstrapped objects will move in the opposite direction, right? It breaks on, now the unstrapped objects will move forward. So speeding up is acceleration. Slowing down is acceleration. Also, the changing direction is acceleration. Here's how we know. In the U.S. in the early 1900s. We know it's the change in direction is acceleration because notice that unstrapped objects, in this case, the people, are moving away from the center. All right, so which means that the acceleration is directed in the opposite direction. All right, so this is the explanation that I was looking for. All right, so even if the people are moving at a constant speed because they're changing direction, the unstrapped objects in a circle, in circular motion, will move away from the center, meaning that the acceleration is directed towards the center. All right, so this is known as the centripetal acceleration or center-seeking acceleration. All right, so the astronauts are actually in an upright centrifuge, meaning that they're sitting up with their backs against the wall, or the seat in this case. Acceleration is directed towards the center, blood is rushing away from, uh, towards the back of their heads. Okay, so that's what's, what's happening. So that's what I was looking for on the test. So it's known as the center seeking or centripetal acceleration. All right, pick, up, pick out the best answer. All right, I see a lot of Ds, so D is the best answer, right? So the car is accelerated inward towards the center. Severe size five points. <clears throat> so that guy who just passed out, passed out, yeah, passed out. So what's exposed about seven Gs? So how did they figure out what speed that the seven Gs of acceleration is going to be induced? All right, so let's take a look at the mathematical modeling of it. So again, this is not a derivation, it's just a modeling that's going to fit the observation. Ignoring the derivations for now. All right. So uniform circular motion means that object is moving at constant speed, so the speed is not going to change. R is your radius, and the acceleration is directed towards the center. Right, so this is the formula that we are using: square of the speed divided by the radius. With that proof, okay. So V is your speed, R is your radius, and that is going to be your centripetal acceleration. So C means centripetal or center-seeking or center-directed acceleration. All right, so that's the formula that we will use. Square of the speed divided by the radius is going to give you the centripetal acceleration. So let's focus on a few real life examples. Just to get a sense for it. All right, guys, I'm muting everyone. So if you have to say something, unmute, unmute yourselves. Anyone who's ever been to an amusement park has felt the force of gravity, 4G on a state of the art roller coaster. It's the G-forces pinning you to your seat that bring the thrills. Ever since planes flew in combat, pilots have been aware of the danger from G-forces. 
1917, a World War I pilot reached 4.5G during a sharp turn. He reported that everything went dark and misty in front of him. In World War II, there were stories of German Schnuka pilots blacking out at 7G. But the advent of the latest jet fighters, like the F-15 and 16 in the United States, and the MiG-29 in the former Soviet Union, has brought a new twist to the problem. These immensely powerful planes can turn faster and tighter than any previous jet. Tight turning is vital, because in a dogfight, the winner is the pilot who can turn inside his opponent, get behind him, and shoot him down. When you roll into the turn, if you don't prepare yourself, what can happen is the G-forces essentially can overcome your body. That feeling of heaviness uh, translates as well to the blood, which is essentially uh, pooling down in the lower extremities of your body and, and uh, not staying up in your brain to allow you to function. As the plane rolls on its side to turn and the pilot rolls with it, the gravitational force is pushing from the head to the feet. The tighter and faster this turn, the greater the G-force. In the latest jets, it can go up to 9G, nine times the force of gravity. The result, the pilot's blood is forced away from his brain. Without blood, the brain becomes starved of oxygen, with the potentially disastrous result of G-lock. Luke Air Base, Arizona. Here, the cream of America's trainee pilots learn to fly the F-16. Some will encounter the full horror of G-lock. Chief instructor and Gulf War veteran Major Robert Kesterson can pass on first-hand knowledge. On a training run in Georgia, he was overcome by G-forces. We were out in a, in a 2v2 situation where the adversaries happened to be F-15s, and we were uh, fighting these guys. We happened to be fairly high speed, about 520 knots or so. And we know we had merged with, the, uh, with these guys, and we were just looking for them visually, and I couldn't see them. I rolled inverted and looked down, and they were just below me. So without thinking about it, without getting prepared, I just pulled back on the stick, and it was about an 8.5G pull. Major Kesterson began to suffer the classic symptoms of G-lock. As the blood drained out of his head, the first organs to be affected were his eyes, resulting in tunnel vision. Then he lost any sense of color. And then, gray out. He could still hear, but that was all. About 40 degrees through that pool, I started getting the gray out, and then it went completely gray, and couldn't see anything, basically. The experienced Major Kesterson, knowing the warning signs, pulled out of his turn just in time. The blood returned to his brain, his sight came back, and he got home safely. <clears throat> okay, so here's a discussion for him. In a dogfight situation. All right, so imagine that you've got two fighter jets. Uh, moving at the same speed, one fighter jet is gonna be able to do a tighter turn. One pilot is able to do a tighter turn. The other guy is not going to be able to do a tighter turn. So who has the advantage in a dogfight? First one or the second one? And why? Uh, the outside one? Because uh, you're not uh, having the same amount of G-force. So. Okay, Christian, I'm going to give you five points for saying the wrong thing. The outside one, <clears throat> I'm thinking, <laughs> he's going to be more comfortable, right? Who's going to have the advantage over the other guy? The guy who can do I'm a tighter turn? Yeah, the tighter turn. Okay, why? He'll be able to complete his turn faster than the outside circle, so he'll be end up behind the outside circle. Give yourself 10 points for that one. Guys, the guy who can handle a high G load, the tighter the turn is, the smarter the radius is, the bigger the acceleration is, right? So the pilot, the fighter jet pilot, who can handle a tighter turn as the upper hand, because he can do a tighter turn and get behind the other guy. Got it? So hence the reason why. The Air Force, as well as the Navy, they prefer pilots, fighter jet pilots, who can tolerate extremely high G loads without passing out. Okay? So these people usually get handpicked. Everyone gets has to check to see what they're talking about. go on to fly the most powerful jets in the world. For some, it will be the F-16 fighter, others the A-10 tank buster. They have just one day to prove their bodies are up to it. An exciting future awaits them all, but only if they can beat G-Lock. A pilot's body can usually withstand 3 to 5G without any ill effect, but an F-16 can pull 9G, enough to push the blood from the head right down to the legs. Today, we're going to go through about two hours of academics here in the classroom. And that's when we're going to go back on the stick, on top, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. The effect is to squeeze and narrow the veins and arteries in the lower body, and thus okay. block blood entering from the head and chest. Okay, I saw a lot of red bases. That's a pretty good sign. To help them with their strain, pilots wear G-suits, trousers that contain air bladders, which automatically inflate at high G, further squeezing the blood vessels in the legs and abdomen. The G-suit inflating around the legs makes it easier to squeeze those muscles against it. It makes it easier to contract those muscles. Okay, so while these guys are training, they do a lot of muscles squeezing, right? 
safety and thus block blood. The effect is to squeeze and narrow the veins and arteries in the... Two, three, one, two, three. The effect is to squeeze and narrow the veins and arteries in the lower body and thus block blood entering from the head and chest. Okay. I saw a lot of red faces. That's a pretty good sign. As they constrict our muscles as hard as possible, right? To help them with their strain. Why do they do that? Because they're trying to control the motion of the blood. They're trying to make sure that the blood is not free to move every which direction. So they're trying to constrain it from moving in the opposite direction of the acceleration. It's make or break time for Captain Scott Meyer. All the way from Pennsylvania, his ambition is to fly A-10 fighters for the National Guard. It means he has to get up to 7.5 G. 18 months of training will be wasted if he fails. And so this guy is trying to qualify for 7.5 Gs. He wants to qualify to actually fly a fighter jet can handle up, up to 7.5 Gs. Have a good ride. Thank you. So I'll test him at 7.5 Gs. He's been, he's been training for 18 months. That's one and a half years. How do you train for something like this? What is it that you do? Let me tell you what not to do. No cardio. Absolutely not. Because it promotes good circulation. Anything that's going to help you build muscles, absolutely not. The bigger the muscles, the better the circulation. You don't want that. So what's got left? The strength training is good because you want to be able to squeeze those muscles at as hard as possible. Anything requiring strength training without building muscles, that's what you need. The other thing that helps is if you can get yourself to a level of healthy, borderline heart disease level, <laughs> that's kind of hard. That's going to help because the good circulation does not help. It's just going to hamper your process. All right. So just McDonald's a couple of times a week. French fries, just sit in front of the TV and squeeze those muscles. That's okay. what you need. All right. I've seen this like a million times. I didn't even have to see it once. I'm looking at this guy. First, oh. This guy seems too healthy to me. All right. If he's going to die, he's not going to die of a heart disease. Not anytime soon. Warm-up run without a G-suit. This guy's probably going to have perfect blood circulation. To establish the level of G's he can tolerate. All right. Coming up for a brief. And he seems very fit. He looks like he's taking care of himself. <laughs> he starts to strain, right. tensing the muscles in his lower body. So the only thing going for him is tensing those muscles, squeezing and tensing, squeezing up tense. And breathing in short, short bursts. Two, three, squeeze the legs, squeeze the legs. And he's struggling. Three. He's about three Gs right now. It's not that hard. One. Now he looks constipated. Two, three. <laughs> I got news for you. That's the last thing you want to see. I, he's squeezing every single muscle. All right, come through five Gs. Good morning, Jess. Good morning, Jess. Three. All right, come through six. One, two. All right. All right, that was too much work. We were almost up to six. It was five plus six. At six G, he aborts the run. I mean, this guy trained, trained, trained. His, his circulation is way too good. Yeah, you were working pretty hard there. We can pick him up seven, seven and a half with a G suit. But if they can find someone and handle it without a G suit, that's what they would do. Sorry, your uh, strain at three point two. Three point two. It's too low. I'm, most of us can handle this without training. Which can be subjective at best, but I think it was a little bit early. Yeah. And it's six flags when you guys accelerate up and down. That's about 3G, so that's how it is. With a rather low tolerance. You got all the way up to 6.6. With a G suit, we should be able to. You can bring them up, but they're going to look for someone else who can handle it without a G suit first. Okay, your first charge is a gradual. Whenever you're ready, just let me know. Back in the centrifuge, it's Lieutenant Jennifer Wilson's yeah, turn. Right here, She's one of the new generation of female yeah. fighter pilots. Anyway, Only since 1993 yeah. have women been allowed to fly fighter aircraft. Okay, the arrival of the likes of Lieutenant Wilson raised a new problem for the G4 scientists. We know that uh, high G tolerance, the ability to maintain G tolerance at high G can be a strength issue. And we know that, that women are basically half as strong as men. So the concern was whether at high G, such as at 9G, would the women be able to perform as well as the men? Okay, so let's get your opinions on that one. Women, do you think, all right, let me give you three options. Do you think women do, will do better, worse, or the same? And justify. What do you guys think? All right, so you can use the chat if you want to. Let me get some opinions. If you want to speak out, just speak out right now. Tell me what you think. Do you think women will do better, worse, or the same? Better? Okay, so who said that? Me, late. Okay, late. Uh, yeah. Late. You think that they women will, will do better? Okay, so what's your justification? Um, well, they can. Um, you know, when they're pregnant, they can. You know, induce more pain. They can handle more pain than men. That's the reason. Oh, there, 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 okay, <laughs> I'll give you five points. Women can handle physical pain better than men. There's no question about it. All right, this, yeah. this, 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 <laughs> I read an article on Facebook. Because they got this artificial intelligence interface, they kind of know what kind of weird stuff that you would read, and that's weird enough for me to read it. I mean, what is the closest thing to women giving birth that the men could experience? Evidently, it's getting kicked in the balls. 
but not once, but repeatedly for two, three hours. So I, I don't think any man can any man can handle something like this. Okay, that's for sure. All right. I mean, if I had to go through something like this once in my life, I would never let anyone near my boss for the rest of my life. Women are like, okay, that was bad, but I think I'm gonna have a second baby. So I get that women can handle that. But how does that translate into handling high G loads? I think they'd handle it about the same. Okay, so you you think you're thinking you know human to human is probably about the same, right? Because there's well, no... it's also like if if it's a bigger person then the because G's are based off a person's own body weight, so a bigger person pulling nine G's is like proportional to their own size. So if if a woman is a little bit smaller than the average man, she, she's still experiencing nine G's, but it's nine G's respective to her own size. <laughs> okay, that's a fair statement. I'm gonna give you five points on that one. Okay, so you're thinking it's not gonna make that much of a difference. All right, so I still need an argument, either better or worse. Okay, who? I need someone to say women will do worse because of this. Does anybody want to make an argument regarding that? Okay, guys, remember it's a strength thing, right? Because you should be able to actually squeeze those muscles, tense, tense up those muscles. So do you think women will do better or worse in terms of strength, in terms of squeezing those muscles? What do you think? Men are stronger, right? Is that what it is? All right. What is the difference between women and men overall? I'm talking about comparison, average size to average size. What's the difference? Men women tend to be stronger. smaller. They tend to be smaller. So just immediately, the smaller size is going to help you because the blood circulation is kind of limited. All right. So the blood is not going to be going all over the place. So being in small size is going to help. So that's a plus for the women. On top of that, look at women, guys. What's the difference? Immediately when you look at someone, you could tell if someone is a male or a female because they don't have the same shape, all right? Women have a lot more curves because of the fat deposits at certain places. They got breasts, they got hips, and they got the breasts and the hips because of the large fat deposits within those places. Does that help? Absolutely, it does, okay? Unlike muscles, they're not as muscular. Fat, you have no blood circulation within fat. On top of that, the fat gets pressed against the skin, so it acts like a natural G suit. All right. So the circulation gets really constrained in women. The circ naturally gets constrained in women because you got, I'm not talking about obesity. I'm talking about regular healthy women. So they, the skin is pushed up against the fat. The fat pushes up against the skin. So it actually, it actually constrains the blood circulation naturally. So that's a good thing. Another thing about women <clears throat> is men, the, the childbirth. Are you kidding? I'm not talking about the pain. What does it take to push a baby out of your body? The core strength that the women have cannot be matched by men. All right, they go through monthly cycles, this and that. The muscles usually contract naturally, so they get all these, you know, um, the pain and all that stuff once a month. The, the women's body are built for something like this, okay? Women's core strength is much, much, much better than the men's in that sense. So who do you think is going to do better? All right, you want to see the difference? Now watch the difference. This woman is going to try to qualify for a fighter jet that can go up to 12 Gs, okay? And they will test her at 9 Gs. Okay, go back and off and roll on this ride. To fly the F-16, Jennifer Wilson has to do a 9G run in the same She must go higher than Captain's mind. Three, three. She's not struggling. One, two, three. Squeeze the muscles, work the muscles. Five, six, she's not struggling. One, two, three. About halfway through, don't give up. Seven and a half G's, she's not struggling. One, two, three. Almost nine and a half G's, she's not struggling. You can take her up to 12, she's still going to be fine. Notice that she's not tensing any of the muscles. She's not squeezing any of the muscles. Uh, yeah, she's feeling the pressure, but she's not passing out. All right, women can naturally handle this better than most men can. I'm talking about average size to average size. Lieutenant Wilson passes the test. This guy is up next. First time. Is this the face of confidence? You're underwater. Kind of drown. Shaking his head. Feeling like. As if he's seen a ghost. You really need to get some air. And he's gonna be up next. That guy is way too fed. And as far as the pressure, he's gonna struggle. Most men do. It's normal. This All right. For doing a war or whatever, um, preference is to use male pilots. All right. That's the preference. And the people that Technology detect usually look like this. They got this body shape. Be perfected. Five seven five eight five nine. Okay. So you go for average size. And live it on the heavy side on purpose. Okay, so these this guys, technology will be this could open the you got a little bit of fat in their bodies, pushed up against the skin on purpose so that constrains the motion of the blood. For a new generation. And obviously of more they don't have the best circulation. That's what they're looking Agile for. Agile aircraft. Equip so the movie Top Gun, someone looks like 
Tom Cruise probably not going to do too well. With the new Combat Edge G-Suit. In terms of handling G-Loads. Lieutenant Boyd Hogan is about to take his body to new extremes. 12 times the force of gravity. A full 3G higher okay. than any current fighter aircraft can pull. Just a week before, Lieutenant Hogan had made his first attempt at a 12G run. This was the result. That was amazing. They took him out of the 12Gs. Hit his face. This uh, guy is glazed over. This one is closed. He's out. Immediately, they bring him down. Uh, last time, uh, doing 12 Gs in the uh, upright seat, and I was tired, and uh, my vision uh, told in on me, and I, um, I couldn't bring it back out. And it's almost like you're dreaming. You wake up, you're like, wow, where am I? And, and, then, and then they laugh at you. Today, he's determined to get the last laugh. <laughs> okay, got your mask up. It's going to be 12 Gs, wrap it on set, strain as needed. This is going to be your last ride. Okay. Down station. Get ready. I'm ready. Get ready. Get ready. Medical. Ready? Get ready. Fine. Ready. Great. Has been activated. Three, two, one. Pressure. Deep breath. Get on it. You're going up. On top. Keep it right. Just two seconds. Lieutenant Hogan is spinning at 12 G. Notice that with the Jesus. It's doable. It's a piece of cake. Coming down. And this. So they pick pilots who can handle G loads naturally. And then they give them specially designed G suits. Time. He's lasted the distance okay. with apparent ease. <laughs> he couldn't have done it without his combat edge suit. It was like, uh, I mean, like a ton of just fell upon you. you can't, I mean, it, it can't move anything. It's, it's a very incredible feeling. All that weight is on your, you know, your, your chest. It's hard to breathe. Uh, but this, uh, this uh, G suit here, though, makes it a lot easier to breathe. What we learned was something. Show gravity. Spending a few days in orbit is one thing, and living there is another. Okay, it's, those of you guys who know something about Elon Musk, he's got a dream. His dream is to get to get to Mars, and hopefully within the next ten years or so, right? That's what he wants to do. <clears throat> Except the trip is going to take probably about six months to get there, and then within that six month period, you're feeling weightless. So what happens to the muscles if you're feeling weightless? In the 1990s, Russian scientists warned their new American partners that prolonged space flight had some disturbing side effects. Some gung ho American astronauts found this hard to believe. I used to think I can't wait until I come back here and debrief you after my mission on Mir to tell you there's no difference between flying a long mission and my previous space flight experience with NASA on the space shuttle. Uh, I was not able to tell them that because they were right. Returning to Earth after four months on Mir, John Blaha tried to unbuckle his seatbelt and got an unpleasant surprise. My hand never made it to the belt buckle. It was literally slammed back down into the floor. And that's when I had my first indication there was something different. I uh, felt like there was this huge magnet that was pulling me to the center of the earth. So much so that when I was laying in a bed 10 hours later in the cool quarters, I felt like I was going to get sucked right through the mattress of the bed. Blaha's muscles had shrunk. He had lost 10% of the soft bone tissue in his hip joint. He needed six months of physical therapy to recover. <clears throat> okay, so what that means is if you're not doing anything and feeling weightless for six months, what happens to you by the time you get to Mars? If you're dropped on Mars, you're not going to be able to walk. You're not going to be able to do anything. Okay, you're like a lump of meat. So what do they do in order to retard its muscle loss in space? Escaping gravity may seem like the most fun anyone could have in space. But floating effortlessly for months or years is not what our bodies evolved to do. To combat muscle and bone loss and maintain their cardiovascular systems, space station dwellers will have to exercise vigorously. But exercise only retards physical deterioration. It's going to retard the deterioration. It cannot prevent it. It's not going to prevent it. So there's still going to be a muscle loss, regardless of what you do. Spending a few Unless somehow, magically, you can generate artificial gravity in space. So the question is, how do you generate artificial gravity in space? What do you have to do? Any ideas? Strap onto a heavy object. <laughs> okay. Yes, give, me, I'll give you five points and ignore that one. Heavy object. Okay, yes, somebody else. You, you have to spin the space station. I don't like this, right? You just have to spin I got plenty of problems with this, evidently, but let's pretend that this works, okay? Because Science Channel had a show on it. I didn't get a chance to record it. Evidently, they've been trying to get this to work, but it, it has an unbalancing effect somehow on people. All right, so the idea is, let's not make it complicated. So it's, you spin it just fast enough. If you're on the wall, you feel like a 1G acceleration, right? So your body is going to want to move in the opposite direction. So you will feel like 
Earth's gravity. Basically, that's the idea. I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask you the following question. If you know the answer, I'm gonna give you ten points for it. What's the name of the first movie? The title of the first movie actually had this idea in terms of generating artificial gravity in space. Science fiction movie. Apollo thirteen. Apollo thirteen. <laughs> give you five points. Space Odyssey. Okay, for Apollo thirteen, I'm gonna give you five points. Space Odyssey two thousand one. I'm gonna give you 20 points for that one. Okay, so uh, Space Odyssey 2001. How many of you guys seen that movie? All right, just years ago. Years ago. So when you saw the movie, did you see it because you wanted to or was that some kind of an assignment? I wanted to. How'd you like it, Alfredo? Uh, I mean, I was like really into space when I was a kid, but I don't really remember, I have to rewatch it. Okay, you don't have to rewatch it. If you don't remember it, that says, that says a lot. Okay. Um, this movie is one of the movies that I've seen in my life. I hate, I don't want to say I hate it the most, but I think it's up there. All right? If I have a blacklist of movies, this movie probably is on top of it. And for saying that, that, there are people who study movies and all that stuff, because I worked in an art school for 20 years. And the people who do films, that this is a classic. All right? And they people love this movie. They love this movie with a passion. I just as passionately dislike this movie. And there's a good reason for it. I think the movie was made in 19, late 1960s, 69 or something. So like I said, I was born and raised in Turkey. By the time we got to Turkey, uh, it was in 1970s. Back then, the movies would take a while. So I was probably, was, you know, I was a kid, and I wanted to see the movie because it was falsely advertised as Star Trek. All right, so I was a huge Star Trek man. Yeah, I'm talking about the original. So uh, try, I convinced my dad to take me to the movie theater. He didn't want to go, so it took a lot of begging. So next thing you know, I'm sitting in the movie theater. I got news for you. Something about this movie, it's all special effects. You got these random com conversations thrown all over the place. And when you're sitting and watching special effects, the, the scenes don't change that much. It's like five minutes long against the classical music. And 20 minutes into the movie, I figured that Mr. Spock, Captain Kirk, are not going to be beaming in, beaming down. So I said, Dad, let's go. This is boring. And he looked at me. He said, he said, are you nuts? This is like one of the best movies ever. So thanks to my dad, I sat there for three hours and watched this movie. I got news for you that three, three hours felt like three years. I still remember every single scene from that movie. In fact, I remember so well that the scene... The movie stuck with me when I was preparing this lecture. All right, so I was in Wheaton, Wheaton Library. I saw the movie in passing. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I was a little kid. What did I know? I didn't have any sophisticated understanding of science. You know, you're just kind of like a Disney type of person at that point. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, let me go watch the movie again. This time, I figured that I would enjoy it. You know, I'm a physicist, right? Again, it was the same thing. Oh my God, I could not tolerate the movie. I tried to watch it. It wasn't going anywhere. I said, okay, I, this is the scene that I wanted to grab. I grabbed it. Just so no, just so that you guys know what I'm talking about. Scene that I'm just <laughs> this scene is almost five minutes long. I'm not gonna bore you with a five minute of this scene. So I'm gonna cut it to the next scene. And then you're on the inside, so that thing is spinning, so it's generating uh, acceleration on this wall. Towards the center, obviously, if you're on that wall, you're gonna feel a push in the opposite direction. And now you're gonna watch this guy jog for five minutes. All right, so, so this movie is a classic. Now, if you're going to be spinning this thing in space, you know, to generate partial gravity, right? Why not spin it at 2Gs or 3Gs? What would happen to you if you experienced acceleration at 3Gs for six months? When you get back to Earth, you're going to feel super light. Or, or you're going to feel much stronger, right? In a sense, it's kind of weird. Yeah, when you get back to Earth, you're going to be much more muscular, in essence. All right, it's an it sweet. All right, so what do we have? We got a space shuttle over in the Earth. And we got these 400 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So I'm gonna end up using the letter D for the distance for this case, all right? So that's the selection that I made. So this time it's expressed in terms of kilometers. So this is a big this is a problem. I didn't really modify it. So each revolution is gonna take 90 minutes. That's what it means. So it's gonna circle the Earth about once, about every 90 minutes. So each revolution takes 90 minutes. So what's the centripetal acceleration? So that's what we want to know. The kilometers to meters, one kilometer is going to be a thousand meters, in case you didn't know. I minutes to seconds, to 400 seconds is fine. All right, now a couple of things we need to do. All right, radius of the earth is something that you would look up normally. And because I use this so many times, I actually memorize this. So that's the number. And what else do we need? Okay, now we want the actual radius of the motion all the way to the space shuttle. All right, so we need this lowercase r. So lowercase r is going to be capital R plus d. And then just add up those two numbers. 
fit, and this, don't forget this thing is moving. So it gives you this number. Okay, so how do you do a problem like this? Okay, I'm gonna introduce something that we will get to use quite a bit in the future if you take physics two with me. This thing is also gonna come up quite a bit. Okay. Are you gonna teach next semester? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I do physics one, physics two, and also physics three if they're offering it over the summer. So if you if you like my style, just just, just stay with me. So, um, so what do we know? What do we know? So we got R, so this is the radial distance. We are looking for the acceleration, centripetal acceleration. So the question is, V is not given, right? So how do we do V? Okay, so I'm gonna show you a trick. This is gonna help you in the future, even if you take it with someone else. V is distance over time, right? So the measured distance over measured time. Okay, so measured distance that is traveling is the circumference of the circle, right? So that's your measured distance. And it takes you 90 minutes to actually go around. So each cycle that you're looking at, each round that you're looking at is gonna take 90 minutes, right? So from that information, now you can figure it out because circumference is gonna be two pi r, and r is this lowercase r, divided by the time it takes for you to actually complete this cycle. So that's known as the period of this motion. So circumference divided by the time is gonna give you the speed in essence. Okay, so that's what we will do. So I say, yeah, let's figure out the speed first. This is gonna be the circumference of the motion divided by the time it takes for you to complete the cycle. All right, so circumference is two pi r. So I'll do a back substitution, um, change my mind. All right, so two pi r divided by t is gonna be v. And then we'll just do a back substitution there. All right, so that expression squared divided by R. And then I'm struggling there because it's late at night. All right, uh, so you got an R squared, you got R. So obviously that's the only cancellation you will have. Boom, boom, boom. And I, I forgot the square. Somebody's gonna tell me that. Okay, now this one magically appears. And then the numbers, I'll, you get a number from someone. This number is ridiculously high, so this is no good and somebody's gonna give me a better number. Okay, now this makes sense. Okay, so it's gonna be less than a G. All right, so for us, it's a, the surface of the Earth is gonna be 9.8. If that day where the space shuttle is, it's 9.2 almost. So it's like nine tenths of a G, so the question is why. 